Thank you, Brother Mike. I appreciate uh, both the announcements and the prayer. So welcome to everyone who has come out tonight to be with us. And uh, for those who may be streaming, I'm Steve Choate, and this is a series of lessons on the minor prophets. They're minor prophets, but they have a major message, which, uh, again, as uh, Brother Michael mentioned in his prayer, does have application to us in our times as well. Well, uh, as you're looking at my title slide, you can see that uh, I have stopped our coverage for a bit. We have actually Haggai, Zechariah, Joel, and Malachi to go to have a complete dozen. And um, I, as I was preparing for Haggai, I kept finding, I, I felt a need to stick in some history because these are tumultuous times for the people in what today we call the Middle East and for God's people, the Jewish people. And uh, so as an art historian, I felt some need to sort of take a break because my textual material was getting clogged up with too many artifacts and too many artistic recreations of major historical events that I wanted to, to say something about however brief. And uh, so that's one of the reasons for this interlude. Another reason is just the nature of the texts. We're dealing with prophecies. We don't know exactly when these various men are prophesying. As I've tried to convey over and over, most of these dates that I've given you are suppositional and they can vary widely. And so for me as the teacher, it was really difficult to to plug in this major historical event happens so many hundred years after its initial prophecy or so many decades later. How do you deal with that? And uh, it just seemed logical now that we're at the point of the kingdom of Judah being taken into the Babylonian captivity to stop, to pause, to take a breath, to sort of look around and assess where we are, where we've been and where we're going. and. Uh, to sew up some of those loose ends for one of a better way of putting it. Another challenge in this series of studies, and I've tried to avoid it. Uh, I told you from the very beginning that I wanted to be squarely focused upon the minor prophets, those 12 books, and as succinctly as I could to try to sum up what the major messages were, as much for my sake as for anyone who chose to attend my class, because for me, it's the major prophets, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Isaiah, uh, Messianic prophecies, and then the minor prophets. And if I'm not careful, they're just a bunch of names, and I just didn't have as clear a focus myself as I needed to. It's often been said that the best way to learn is to teach I'm sure most, if not all of you, have heard that before. As a teacher and uh, one who's made his career in teaching, I can tell you this is true. And this is one reason why I went into teaching, because I love learning and I wanted to learn more. And there's really no better way to learn than to teach. And I'm sure you've also heard that most preachers preach the messages they need to hear. Well, to borrow from Amos, I'm not the preacher I am a son of a preacher. But uh, anyway, uh, I teach the, the classes that I need to teach because I need to learn those lessons and I need that knowledge myself. And so all of that to say that I've really tried to keep the focus squarely on these 12 books. And we all know, if you know anything about the Old Testament, there are a lot of collateral texts. They're the major prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Lamentations. I've just mentioned some of them. There are uh, really Nehemiah, Ezra, uh, the uh, prophets and the uh, people who are dealing with rebuilding Jerusalem after the return. And there are the books of history as well, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. This could not just be a year's worth of study if we incorporated all of that. 
quite honestly, this could be a lifetime of study uh, because the material is so very, very rich. And uh, so this is one reason why I'm sort of taking a break here at the two-thirds point and uh, looking around and uh, assessing and sharing some basic things with you before we go, uh, go forward from that point. So uh, as I have been doing, and as is part of my whole goal, uh, I let me sum up where we've been and uh, what we've gotten to thus far. So Jonah is actually called to, by God, to go to the Assyrians and to preach repentance to them. But God also, as we know from the story, is urging the prophet to repent of his hate-filled ways toward those pagan peoples. Amos, God judges the nations, including his own people, the northern kingdom Israel and the southern kingdom Judah, and uh, Israel's sentence is pronounced, the northern kingdom. Hosea, God condemns the spiritual adultery of Israel through the lives of Hosea and his wife Gomer. Micah, God's will is done. Israel is taken into exile by the Assyrians due to her sin, never to return. Zephaniah, God warns Judah and the surrounding kingdoms of coming punishment. And then Nahum, God's will is done. Nineveh is overthrown and Assyria falls to the Babylonians. Habakkuk, God's will is done. Judah is taken into exile. God's actions are questioned by Habakkuk on behalf of the people. Habakkuk affirms faith in God. And then most recently, last Wednesday, Obadiah, God's will is done. The Edomites are judged and condemned. Edom will fall. So uh, that's where we've gotten so far. And uh, I think it might be a good point in time in fact, to look at some of the collateral texts. So to set the stage for the things that I want to share with you tonight, let's uh, flip over to Second Chronicles. And I'm going to be reading chapter from chapter 36, and uh, we'll be dealing with verses 9 on through the end of that chapter and the book. So again, Second Chronicles 36, 9 on through verse 23. So uh, we read, Jehoiakim was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months and ten days, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, if you're wondering how on earth can an eight-year-old do evil in the sight of the Lord, uh, the collateral text to this, which is 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 8, tells us that Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king. And that's what the Septuagint, uh, a later text, uh, tells us. The idea here is that he was not 18 years old, period, biologically, but he was eight years into his reign. And uh, so this is one of those things that agnostics and atheists will point to and say, well, there's, you know, there's conflict here. Uh, so let's, let's really quickly deal with that. Second Kings, as I've said, chapter 24, verse 8. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother's name was Nehushtra, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem and the city was besieged. Uh, then Jehoiakim, king of Judah, his mother, his servants, his princes, and his officers went out to the king of Babylon. And the king of Babylon in the eighth year of his, Jehoiakim's reign, took him prisoner. So I don't know about an eight-year-old, but a 26-year-old can do a lot of evil. And uh, I think that explains why uh, we read in Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 9, that he was eight 
because he was only eight years into his rule. So let's turn back there, 36, chapter 36 of 2 Chronicles, uh, verse 10. At the turn of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar summoned him and took him to Babylon with the costly articles from the house of the Lord and made Zedekiah, Jehoiakim's brother, king over Judah and Jerusalem. Now, by this point in time, uh, obviously the big power is the Neo-Babylonian empire with Babylon as its head. Uh, Nabopolassar, the king of Nebuchadnezzar, has overthrown the Assyrians uh, along with a coalition of allies, the Medes, the Persians, the Scythians, and the Sumerians. And so uh, Nabopolassar, is, his power is inherited by his son, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the greatest of the Neo-Babylonian rulers. Judah is under fealty. It's under subjugation to this great power off to the north and a bit off to the east, uh, the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And so Jehoiakim is misbehaving, and in consequence, he is taken into captivity. And uh, Zedekiah, his brother, is established. Verse 11, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord his God and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who had made him swear an oath by God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the leaders of the priests and the people transgressed more and more according to all the abominations of the nations and defiled the house of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand. And all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. To fulfill the words of the Lord, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. So uh, that's sort of a uh, foundational text for uh, the material that I prepared to share with you tonight that hopefully will fill in some gaps in this 70 year period. I've been alluding to uh, the exile of the people and highlighted it particularly uh, in Habakkuk. But as I've said, we don't know exactly when it takes place in conjunction with the prophetic writings. And uh, so we'll go a little bit more into that. Uh, we're even gonna back up a little bit to the time of the downfall of Israel, the Northern Kingdom. I wanna share with you a few archeological finds. When I told my wife uh, earlier today that uh, there was no text for tonight. She said, you're going to have some scripture, right? This is not just going to be an art history class, is it? <laughs> it's not. Uh, but it's, it's close. <laughs> you know, at Harding, we're, we're supposed to teach and preach and show our faith and share our faith. And I try to do that. Um, but in any case, uh, I want to conclude with some of the benefits of this period of exile. We've already been given one. 
in a way we can't really fully understand even the earth, the land itself uh, was given a Sabbath, a rest for 70 years. And uh, that was important to God or it would not be here. All right, so I love maps and I love timelines uh, because they help me to get in context with, with where I am. And so this is one that I found online that uh, I actually used in order to draw up some of my dates and some of my information that I've given you on this handout. So uh, this picks up uh, about 850 BC and it continues on. And uh, you can see here the various dates of the various prophets. Jonah, of course, and Nahum and Habakkuk are all preaching toward uh, really foreign peoples, the Ninevites of Assyria, as well as the Edomites, uh, Habakkuk. And uh, then we have Amos and Hosea and Micah and uh, Zephaniah. And you also see how this falls in terms of the Assyrian captivity of about 722, 721 B.C. and the divide between these prophets and the ones who come fo uh, following that and are prophesying to the people of Judah. And uh, then we have, uh, after that, the captivity of the people of, of Judah going into Babylonian captivity. And we conclude with Joel, although some would put Joel as early as the 9th century B.C. I'm going with this later uh, 5 to 400 B.C. date. And then Malachi, the last of the Old Testament uh, writers before we have the new. So I hope that uh, that's helpful. Here's another one, very similar And uh, here, this is, ooh, ah, this is broken down according to really the various spheres of influence. So these are the foreign peoples, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, as you see, and their relative years of power. And uh, Jonah and Habakkuk are called to, uh, or Jonah and Nahum, rather, are called to preach to them. And then you've got Amos and Hosea are called to preach to Israel, and then to Judah, all of the rest down here. And again, the division according to dates. So uh, maybe this will help us to uh, put all of these events into context. I've mentioned to you from time to time the overlapping nature of these prophetic missions and how this or that prophet is dealing not only with the same issues at the same time as other minor prophets, but also some of the major ones as well. And uh, so we have the northern kingdom taken into exile in about 722, 721 B.C. And although I think this illustration is supposed to be Joshua leading the people through the river Jordan, work with me on this, I'm using this as an Assyrian leading a whole lot of Israelites into captivity never to return. But we don't just have to color our imagination with artists of today whose works give us some sense of what this might have looked like. We also have authentic artifacts that give us some sense of what this looked like from the aesthetic and the experience, the worldview, you might say, of ancient peoples. So this is actually a relief that uh, is dating around the time of the, the people of Israel being taken into captivity, 722, 721. It actually depicts uh, an Assyrian soldier. So there he is. And these are captives who have their goods over their backs. These are actually people uh, that precede the northern kingdom of Israel being taken into exile. These are the people of ancient Astartu, which was a city uh, today. This area is in modern Jordan. And uh, they were taken into captivity by the Assyrian ruler Tiglath-Pileser III around 730 to 727 BC. And this relief, so typical of the Assyrian kings and the images and the cuneiform script that accompanied them, you can actually dimly make out some of that here, which if we could read cuneiform, I'm sure would uh, be like a signboard. 
uh, that describes these things. And these are the things that adorn the walls of these ancient Assyrian kings. Uh, this relief came from the southwest palace of Tiglath-Pileser in one of the Assyrian capitals, Nimrod. Well, I've already shared with you the rogues gallery of the downfall of the Northern Kingdom. And uh, these are actually a series of four Assyrian kings. There was no one conflict. There was no one deportation. This happened over a, an extensive period of time, beginning with that very king, Tiglath-Pileser III, who ruled about 745 to 727 BC. And uh, he was, as with almost all of them, very cruel and very ruthless. But he began the subjugation of Israel and Judah, as well as making inroads even further down south, uh, Philistia, and uh, further down south than that. Uh, the Assyrians made inroads, as we've already seen, into Egypt as well, and conquered the uh, Egyptian New Kingdom capital of Thebes. Tiglath-Pileser was succeeded by his son, Shalmaneser V, who only ruled for about five years. Uh, we don't know exactly what happens here in the dynastic lines. It may be that his younger brother assassinated him. Sometimes Sargon II, Shalmaneser's uh, successor, is thought to be the younger brother. Sometimes some say, no, this is an outsider. This is somebody else altogether. He's not even from the royal family. And so those who follow that track say that he establishes what is called the Sargonid dynasty, dynasty of Assyrian kings. Uh, this is the man, as I've described him to you, who wanted to conquer the world seriously. And uh, he ended what uh, Shalmaneser V had begun in terms of the mass deportation of the people of Samaria, not only the capital, but the outlying areas of the Northern Kingdom, 10 tribes that would go into exile never to return. I shared with you a little bit about his great city, uh, Dur Shurukin, the horizon of Sargon, uh, a, a fortified palace that uh, he constructed. But after his death in about 705 BC and his son Sennacherib inheriting the second of the Sargana dynasty, uh, Sennacherib abandoned uh, Dur Shurukin and uh, he uh, reinstituted his rule in Nineveh and ruled from 705 to 727. And this is that Assyrian king who, having made uh, really the conquest of Israel complete, now turns his attention down to the Levant, the eastern seaboard of the Mediterranean, makes inroads into Philistia, uh, conquers uh, Lachish. I showed you a relief from the British Museum of uh, Sennacherib overseeing the uh, despoiling of Lachish. And uh, according to his own claim, hymns in Hezekiah like a bird in a cage. But remember, that's the Assyrian point of view. Uh, we're told in uh, God's word that uh, the angel of the Lord smote the Assyrian army and 250,000 died. And Sennacherib packed up his bags and he went back home. Uh, there to be assassinated by his own sons. So uh, this is that rogues gallery again. And uh, not that we have to look at archaeology. I, I certainly don't believe that. What's the point of faith if it has to be buttressed up by facts? But it is nice when facts are discovered. And this is one reason why I've shared as much as I have with you about archaeology. One of the notable archaeologists I've shared with you a little bit about is Sir Austin Henry Layard. Now remember, he's the guy who actually was not an archaeologist, but a diplomat stationed by his government, the British government, in the Middle East, and uh, really uh, fell in love with the Middle East, that part of the world, was intrigued by the massive mounds or tells of man-made debris that are the signal in that part of the world of ancient habitations. And according to his own report, wanted to remove as much of the valuable artifacts of the mound by modern day Mosul, the site of ancient Nineveh, with as little effort and expense as possible. So this was not a trained archeologist. He basically was somebody looking for uh, antiquities. 
But nevertheless, Layard is uh, notable in the history of archaeology because uh, he's only the second notable figure to examine the mound of Kyunyuk, the ancient site of Nineveh, close by modern Mosul, and in digs that extended from 1845 to 1851, uh, made extensive finds. And among their, those finds, and I've touched on his career, uh, he found annals, writings, records, histories of these ancient rulers. He found uh, at Nineveh the palace of Sennacherib, uh, again, the successor to Sargon. He also found parts of the library of Ashurbanipal, the last great Assyrian ruler. And uh, there are somewhere between 22 to 30,000 clay tablets and fragments of tablets that were discovered in this massive uh, cuneiform library. And uh, among them, some really amazing things. If you've never heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh, this is one of the oldest great heroic epics in the world. Uh, it's thought to go all the way back to the third millennium BC, the time of the very first uh, Mesopotamian civilizations, the Sumerians. And uh, it uh, actually has haunting references to Old Testament Genesis elements. We encounter, for example, Utnapishtim, the Sumerian Noah. And uh, again, many fascinating connections that if we had the time I could go into. But this was such a prized ancient poem, uh, about 1300 years older than the earliest heroic epic in the West, Homer's Iliad, that uh, the Babylonians and the Assyrians uh, made copies of this ancient epic. And this was one of the texts that was recovered from the library of Ashurbanipal dating from the 7th century BC, carefully preserved by the Babylonians and the Assyrians, but again, probably going back as far back as about 2100 BC. Well, that's literature, that's poetry, and we're not here for that. Here is another uh, example of the kind of things that uh, Layard found in this extensive library. Uh, this is actually the annals of Tiglath-Pileser III, who was the very first of the Assyrian kings who began the despoilment of Israel and the deportation of her people, as I've shared with you, to be followed by Shalmaneser, Sargon, and Sennacherib. And so because of these finds, uh, really archeology span affirms uh, what we have in the Bible in a powerful way. And these people aren't just artificial records and uh, really uh, carvings in stone, but they are fleshed out. Uh, because of the accounts that they left us about their own lives and their own values and their worship of their own gods. And uh, that's what this effort to recreate an ancient Assyrian king is intended to represent, that they take on substance. They seem like real people. They take on really a fleshly quality because of the ancient writings that they have left us that preserve some sense of their values and the records of their lives. Well, uh, the northern kingdom then is taken into exile over a series of years, and uh, that through many deportations. So this map shows us uh, something of this and how these various peoples were taken and distributed really throughout the Mesopotamian River Valley and even beyond. And as we know, the practice of the Assyrians was also to take another conquered people and settle them in the land that they had just depopulated and that's how the Samaritans come about, because these foreign peoples brought in at this time, the 8th century BC, intermarry with uh, the Jews that are still there. And we have another people, the Samaritans, whom the later Jews, thinking of themselves purely as God's people, hated and despised in Christ's time. Well, here's another timeline. I hope nobody's getting tired of timelines. My students don't like them. I know that from evaluations. <laughs> so uh, here's one that I found uh, on, I think this was from Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a wonderful resource. 
And as you may be able to read, I don't know, maybe you can't. This is based upon uh, really the chronology of Israel and exile uh, by this author. And uh, wow, I got this right off of Wikipedia and I got my readers on and I don't have my long distance glasses. So this may be entirely useless because <laughs> my notes are too small to read it either. But the death of Josiah is followed by the reign of Jehoiakim. And as we've seen, he is taken into uh, captivity himself. And uh, no, Jehoiakim. And then the reign of Jehoiakim, who is taken into captivity. We just read that text. And then we have, boy, I wish I had my long distance glasses. Zedekiah made king of Judah. And uh, the corroborative dates. And then we have uh, five, whatever that is. Uh, and we have the Babylonian, anti-Babylonian conspiracy that Zedekiah begins. And uh, so then we have following that uh, Nebuchadnezzar sieging Jerusalem and taking Jerusalem, the, the, the elite, into captivity. It's believed that Daniel was one of the notables taken into captivity at that time. So also mentioned here is Yehuda. And uh, I'm fascinated with names and words, so I was puzzled by that. I didn't really realize that this is the Jewish for Judah, which means thanksgiving or praise. So this is the Hebrew name for the land of Judah. And uh, then uh, we have uh, the continued timeline gives us uh, the release of Jehoiakim as late as 562 B.C. He's been 37 years in captivity, but he elects to stay in Babylon. And uh, then we have following that, uh, Persia conquers the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, and uh, then we have uh, the decree of Cyrus, which allows the people to go back in 538 B.C. And uh, then uh, another return uh, to Yehud or Yehuda uh, between 520-something and 515. Dr. Kynell, I need some help. He was just in here counting our heads, but... Uh, in any case, uh, so it's not just the Assyrians that left records of what they were doing. Uh, here is a small cylinder. I think you can make out the, oops, I think you can make out the cuneiform on it. These sometimes are quite small. I don't have the exact measurements of this one, but I think it's about half a foot, five, six inches. So it's a small cylinder that, oh, goodness gracious. That has uh, got cuneiform all around it. It's the Nabopolassar cylinder. Remember, Nabopolassar was the father of Nebuchadnezzar. He was the one who led the coalition of allies to overthrow the Assyrians in Nineveh. And uh, I'm told that the cuneiform here speaks of rebuilding Babylon's walls. And uh, now I'm going to hearken back to some of the information that I've shared with you from an earlier lesson, specifically the one that dealt with Habakkuk. Uh, because there I highlighted ancient Babylon. And if you remember, those of you who are here, I shared with you a little video that gave us a sense of the recreated Babylon. Um, Babylon, remember, is a very, very large city. It perhaps was the largest city in the world at that time. It may have been the first city to reach a population above 200,000. And the ancient Greek uh, historian of the 5th century BC, Herodotus, shares with us in his The History uh, various uh, dimensions that uh, he ascribes to Babylon. He says it's 480, the wall was 480 furlongs in circumference, which is about 60 miles. It's perfectly square. Each side measured 15 miles long. Moreover, Herodotus says that the wall of Babylon was 200 cubits in height, about 300 feet. And as I told you at that time, I'll repeat now, 
Most historians today think that this is hyperbole, that it's exaggeration, but it may have been as much as 150 feet. And uh, Herodotus also says that the wall of Babylon uh, was 50 cubits wide, about 75 feet wide, uh, large enough, wide enough for four chariots to ride down it abreast. And he also said that it boasted 100 brass gates. Well, among those great gates would surely have been the Ishtar Gate, which I've shown you various times. This is one of the major entranceways into ancient Babylon, that great city. And uh, this is another effort to recreate it, complete with animal symbols that represent uh, the god Marduk and uh, uh, also the uh, god Adad, the gods of uh, sun and storm, respectively. Now, I'm returning this uh, to the screen because you, you've gotten some sense of this, but also because it was near the Ishtar Gate that this particular text was discovered, which uh, seems in a remarkable way to uh, verify what we've just read in, in, uh, in the text in 2 Kings, uh, or rather 2 Chronicles, because this is Jehoiakim's ration tablet text that speaks of the rations that uh, the deposed and exiled King Jehoiakim will receive while he is a resident here at Babylon. Uh, this text was recovered in the late 19th, dawning of the 20th century, and uh, it was found in a vaulted underground room uh, not too far from this site, the site of the Ishtar Gate. And so uh, this is corroborative archaeological evidence of the very events that we're talking about here, uh, the exile of the people of uh, Judah into Babylonian captivity. I don't think I've shared this work with you before, but I have mentioned the artist. Uh, Jacques Tissot was a French artist, academically trained, who uh, lived uh, many years in England and uh, spent the, the latter part of his life following a reconversion to his Catholic faith and painting all kinds of wonderful Old and New Testament biblical scenes. And uh, this one, as you can see, is <laughs> depicting uh, Jerusalem and the people of uh, Jerusalem, the capital, being taken into exile by uh, Babylonian uh, guards and soldiers. And uh, Tissot, uh, I think, does really a wonderful job in recreating these ancient scenes. So uh, while they're there, the initial impact must have been very, very difficult. They've been taken from their homes after much death and destruction. We're told, as we read the collateral texts in the Old Testament, that the temple is destroyed. Uh, really, the palaces are destroyed. We just read that. And uh, in consequence, a lot of destruction, a lot of death. Their wealth has been largely taken from them. And they are taken to Babylon. Uh, apparently, the, uh, the nobility and the educated first. But uh, this continues on until uh, basically Jerusalem is left desolate. And there, ironically, they are urged to sing the songs of Jerusalem, of Zion. And uh, here's another collateral text that I've shared with you, Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it, for there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Well, obviously, this is a beautiful poem that speaks of uh, the grief of the exile taken from his motherland and suffering there. But it also speaks, I think, of a common spirit of unification that is welding the people of, of Judah together. And uh, in the face of their trials that they're suffering together, making them strong and stronger. So uh, again, the painting, I think, is a wonderful recreation. This one is not by Tissot, but uh, I did share one with you by him. And uh, it, too, is a marvelous uh, effort to recreate the sense of grief 
that the peoples of uh, exile, the peoples of Jerusalem are feeling. Their harps uh, really are useless to them and uh, they're by the river of Babylon, the Euphrates. Well, a lot is going on during this 70 year period and we do not have the time to uh, cover it, but I do wanna summarize some things. We know that in that context, the select of the elite are taken aside and these young men are groomed and fed from the king's table. We also know that some of them uh, really refused the king's foods because it violated uh, really food concerns of the Jewish law. And among them, Daniel and the figures we know of as uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so that's described in uh, Daniel, I believe in chapter one. And uh, then we also have the uh, story where Nebuchadnezzar has this dream that troubles him and uh, it cannot apparently be interpreted by any of his wise men until this young Daniel is brought in who's blessed with insight from God himself. And so Daniel chapter two, we have this dream of the statue of the man made of many metals. And uh, so here's an artist trying to recreate that scene, that amazing scene that uh, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed with the various uh, metals that comprise this, this sculpture. And if you remember your Daniel, then you know that the story of the dream ends with a rock uncut by human hands rolling down and crushing this and filling the whole earth. Well, uh, the dream is uh, really a fascinating prophecy in and of itself. Generally, the interpretation is that the head of gold represents Babylon, the very kingdom that we're dealing with here. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is the greatest of the kings of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And so it comprises about 605 to 539 BC. We're told that the breast was of silver. Generally, that's taken to interpret or to be Persia. 539 to 331 BC, the successor power after the Babylonians fall. The thighs were of brass. This is Greece, 331 to 168 BC. The legs are of iron. This is Rome, 168 to BC to AD 476, the fall of Rome in the western half of the Roman Empire. And then the feet of iron and clay divided Europe, the Dark Age period onward, uh, presumably in the prophetic sense to this very day. So from high precious metals to more base metals and strong metals until we get to feet of clay and iron. Well, in spite of uh, the amazing triumph that Daniel had over the other wise men of the court, uh, you know what follows. Chapter three deals with the image of gold. And for some strange reason, Daniel doesn't even appear in this chapter, but his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do. And uh, this is such a wonderful story. How can, how can we not take a moment to, to focus on it? Nebuchadnezzar raises this image, this gold image. We don't know exactly what it looked like, but uh, here is an artist attempting to recreate it high on this column. And uh, if you can make it out, these are all of the uh, uh, obedient uh, servants and slaves and uh, followers of Nebuchadnezzar bowing down when the music is played. The defiant Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to do obeisance to this idol. And uh, so we read, then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and fury gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you're ready at the time, you hear of the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I've made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? That is a defiant statement. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not... 
And I love that. Let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Brethren, that is faith. I, I wish I could say I had that kind of faith. That is faith. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth, the fourth is like the Son of God. What a marvelous image uh, that is, and what a powerful affirmation of a defiant faith true to God and God's will. Well, uh, that is one of the great stories, and uh, then we have... What follows? Nebuchadnezzar, in spite of what he's seen, what he's witnessed, the presence of Daniel and these men of faith is a man of great pride. He's refurbished the walls. He's made Babylon strong. He creates many wonders, including, according to legend, the uh, great uh, hanging gardens of Babylon. He's very wealthy. He forgets God. Here's uh, the uh, Ishtar Gate in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, where uh, part of it is reassembled today. Here's an effort to recreate it. Now, among those great walls that he builds, uh, encompassing all those miles of territory, just think about all of those thousands and indeed millions of bricks that would have been used to make these mighty walls. And yet, archaeologists have found on these bricks inscribed boasting messages like this one. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who cares for Esagila and Isaida. These are pagan gods, uh, temples to pagan gods. Eldest son of Nabopolassar, king of Babylon. So is that not bearing witness to the great pride of Nebuchadnezzar? This is a great work of what in our history is called aggrandizement a great work which boasts of the power, the wealth, the resources of a great king. And so Nebuchadnezzar, as we are told, uh, was warned of his great pride and warned that in consequence of it, he would be brought down. And so he was, as we read in Daniel chapter 4. After he was so warned, 12 months later, the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. He said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour, the text tells us, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. Of course, we don't know what this looked like, but uh, the imaginative romantic painter William Blake gives us, I think, a very stirring image following very closely to the text in his Nebuchadnezzar 1795. And if you look closely, uh, really the appendages from his thighs and his chest actually do look like feathers thanks to the uh, work of Blake's brush and his fingernails and toenails are like claws and talons. 
So Nebuchadnezzar was debased in some form that we do not fully understand for seven times. We don't know if this is seven days, seven weeks, or seven years. The text is very vague, but I think we all know that in Jewish culture, seven means complete perfection. So it was sufficient time to humble Nebuchadnezzar, and so indeed he was humbled. We're told after that period of time, his senses were returned, and he stepped right back into power. Now, in the ancient world, this never happens. If the king is weak, then he goes down, sometimes by the hands of his own family, his sons. Uh, but any sign of weakness is a sign of deposing the king and let's get on. This is clearly from the hand of God because for some reason, surely just to show God's sovereignty, Nebuchadnezzar's power was held for him by a regent until this period of seven times passed, and then he stepped right back into power again. We're so close. <laughs> so very close. Belshazzar, his successor, uh, really uh, is overthrown, and we have the writing on the wall of Daniel chapter 5. Many, many, tuckle ye farson. You've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Your kingdom will be given to the Medes and Persians. Literally, this means numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. And the old prophet Daniel actually interprets the famous writing on the wall. And so Cyrus, as we've seen, comes into power uh, because we're told the Euphrates River, which ran through the walls, was diverted, and the Medes and Persians made inroads into the city, and it fell in a night, an almost bloodless fall. So Cyrus, the king of Persia, comes into power, and uh, here is the famous Cyrus Cylinder, which is one of the notable artifacts of his time. And uh, here is one of his bold statements, Cyrus, king of the world, king of Ashan, this is Persia, son of Cambyses, son of king of Ashan, the great gods uh, delivered all the lands into my hand, and I made this land to dwell in peace. And what a kingdom it was, a truly great empire stretching all the way from Persia in the east, uh, really to the borders of the Indus, today modern day India, all the way to the west, uh, to uh, Egypt and uh, to Greece. So in conclusion, and there's Susa and Persepolis, the twin capitals. In conclusion, benefits of the Babylonian captivity, which I really don't have the time to go into, but I want to at least enumerate them. After this period of exile, 70 years, the people come back to Jerusalem. They are cured of idolatry, that recurrent problem that they dealt with throughout the Old Testament. We don't really hear of any idolatry going on in New Testament times. They had other problems. The rise of the scribes and the growth of rabbinic literature, particularly the Mishnah, the oral law, and the Gemara, the commentaries on the Mishnah, as well as the Babylonian Talmud. The synagogue comes into birth during this time in order to keep the people together and to share God's precious word because it had become precious to them. It was a vestige of their culture and their heritage and most importantly, the relationship of God with God through religion. And so the teaching of the scriptures by scribes like Ezra was really vital to maintain the knowledge of God in the minds of the growing generations. And uh, the ultimate result of this was a unification of the people. And uh, in consequence of that, uh, the people are ready to return after two generations, a little over two, to uh, destroy Jerusalem and rebuild it. Well, we're out of time and passed out of time, uh, so let me uh, share with us a word of prayer, and we will be done. Father, thank you for, again, your word and for its precious truths and the way it guides and guards our lives if we allow it to do so. I pray that you would help us to not make the mistakes that the peoples of Israel and Judah made in turning away from you and having to suffer in order to come back to you, but that we would strive to put your word in our heart 
and to live it out in our actions and through our lives. In so doing, I pray that you would touch our hearts and help us to give and to help those around us who suffered loss in the recent storms, to reach out to brothers and sisters who are in need of comfort and encouragement due to illness and recovery from illness. We've had many names mentioned tonight, and I pray that you would reach down and touch them with healing hands and that you would bless them as they recover. Thank you for all of the many blessings of life, but most of all, we thank you for Christ. And it's in his, in his name I pray, amen.